Coming up on City Span, a pleasant surprise for Savannah property owners. Combating crime in Savannah, a meeting of the minds. Sploss dollars at work, improving public safety. And transitioning youth to adulthood, teaching practical skills for a productive future. Stay tuned, City Span starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Margaret Williams. Welcome to City Span, your source for news and information about Savannah City Government. First up, a downward trend that began in 1996 continued earlier this month when Savannah City Council voted to lower the property tax rate for Savannah property owners. By a unanimous vote, Council agreed to roll back the rate from 12.5 mills to 12.48 mills, marking the lowest millage rate in Savannah since 1987. I think it, it speaks to the staff and it speaks to the city manager and to Dick Evans and all of the folks in finance that have worked so hard um, that we can actually offer a slight reduction to our residents um, in times when other governments are raising those taxes. So I think that's to be noted here publicly and congratulated to the city manager. Since 1996, the city of Savannah has reduced its property rate by 29% from 17.46 mills to 12.48 mills. The reduction has been made possible through the creation of the special purpose local option sales tax, which has funded more than 300 million worth of capital improvements, half of which has been spent on drainage improvements. An estimated 40% of the 1% sales tax, known as SPLOS, is paid by visitors to Savannah. That aff affords us an opportunity to do the infrastructure, build centers, programming, build police departments, fire departments, and all those things with one penny. One the millage rate, combined with the assessed value of your property, is used to determine your property tax bill. The recent reduction equals the rollback rate, the amount required to offset the increase in the City of Savannah's property tax digest due to reassessments over the past year. 2013 marks the first significant year-over-year -year growth in the tax digest since 2008 another sign of economic recovery. Officials from law enforcement, local government, and the larger criminal justice system came together in July to look for solutions to increase public safety in Savannah. While statistics show that overall crime is at its lowest point since the 1970s, officials agree that a new level of collaboration must occur to make Savannah a safer community. Just on last evening, we lost two very young lives, a 15-year-old and an 18-year-old. Um, I think that we all can agree today that our purpose for being here is just really important. These sober thoughts by City Manager Stephanie Cutter opened the Public Safety Roundtable, aimed at trying to find a solution to Savannah's crime problems. Conference moderator Clara Axum called for an honest dialogue between officials from city and county government, law enforcement, and the legal and educational systems in order to gain a genuine understanding of the dynamics fueling the problem. And she pleaded with participants to strive for answers, not accusations or justifications. At least one conference participant argued there are tried and true methods for fighting crime that had been shown to work in places like New York City. But there was no clear consensus on a silver bullet when it comes to Savannah. While statistics show crime is at its lowest rate in 30 years, there was consensus that systemic changes needed to occur to break the cycle of generational crime. Is it a problem that can actually be fixed and solved uh, and dealt with? And our conclusion was that when police departments get it right and they leverage all the resources in their community, they can have dramatic results. The, the, the sad part is I don't think the problem has been dealt with. In 04, murder rates per 100,000 in Savannah were about 17. Today, they're about the same. Where we have stayed essentially the same crime-wise, New York City has gotten their homicide down, rate down to about 4 per 100,000. So, I mean, that is significantly uh, uh, safer than we are. While some officials pointed out that Savannah's crime problem was mainly due to a hard core of repeat offenders, 
Joe Buck, president of the Savannah Chatham Public School Board, said the issue ran much deeper than the symptoms being talked about. It all really is about poverty. It's all about the haves and the have-nots and the, the percentage of poverty that we have in this community. All of us can sit here and look at each other all afternoon and talk about all the great programs we're doing after, but we're not really getting to the heart of the matter, which is increasing the wage and the income for the average family in this community so that they're not on food stamps, so that they have a, a meaningful job, and so their kids understand the value of work. No one offered specific solutions, and it was clear that answers to the crime question were not going to be easy or formulaic. Three committees will be created out of the roundtable, which will research specific issues and make recommendations for change. We'll keep you updated on the progress. Hundreds of business leaders as well as local, state, and federal officials gathered at the Civic Center on August 1st for the annual Mayor Small Business Conference. With most indicators pointing to a brighter future after a long economic downturn, the mood among the attendees at the conference was upbeat and the feeling was infectious. Optimism. That's the word that best describes this year's Mayor's Small Business Conference. After a long haul through a tough economy, the mood was upbeat and participants eager to get their businesses back on track after signs the economy is on the upswing. The conference provided opportunities to share the optimism with fellow business owners and to find ways to capitalize on emerging opportunities. Susan Sparrows, president and CEO of Sparrows Technology and one of the conference presenters, said attendees were looking for ways to be smarter and more nimble now that there appears to be more running room in an expanding economy. I think everybody's looking for a way to reinvent and to revitalize and to gather together and get ideas. So I see the economy starting to get a little bit better. People are starting to loosen up a little bit more. So I think it's, everybody's just, they do have that energy. And it was evident at the conference. The one day event in the Civic Center featured a series of local and regional speakers, such as Terry Dennison, Georgia director of the U.S. Small Business Administration. There was also a business roundtable, hosted by B. Ray of the Creative Coast, which featured a panel of local experts who shared their personal stories and provided insights into the current business climate. The main theme throughout the conference was a shared enthusiasm that the worst days were behind us and prospects were bright. Susan Sparrows said conferences such as these were perfect opportunities to amplify that positivism and to build confidence. I would say stay connected, stay engaged, watch what's going on, read the paper, look at the news, talk to people so you can stay engaged to know what is going on. The conference has been held every year since 2007. This year it was sponsored by Georgia Power, the Savannah Area Chamber of Commerce, and the Savannah Economic Development Authority. It's been more than two years in the making, but Savannah Fire and Emergency Services' newest state-of-the-art fire station has opened in the Thomas Square neighborhood. Savannah Fire's Mark Keller has more. Construction of the new Thomas Square fire station has been described by many people as an exercise in patience and perseverance. More than two years removed from the groundbreaking and after overcoming many obstacles and setbacks, City officials were finally able to hold a grand opening, dedication, and ribbon cutting for the city's newest fire station. The new 16,000 square foot facility is home to Engine Company 5 and Truck Company 5 and houses more than two dozen firefighters, along with Savannah Fire Investigators and the city's fire marshal's office. The total cost to construct the station was about $2.8 million. Funding for the construction came from special purpose local option sales tax money. And First Great District things. Alderman Van Johnson says it's a testament to what the city can accomplish with the voter approved funds. It's also a testament of a wonderful building put in a very, very tight spot, but in a very, very critical spot because it serves an institutional use as well as a civic use because this houses also community space that will be utilized by the several neighborhoods, very distinct neighborhoods, but they're all intersected almost at this spot. 
Savannah Mayor Edna Jackson says city officials fought hard to include this fire station in SPLOST funding because they didn't want to have to raise property taxes to construct the facility. She says the grand opening marked a great day for the city and the citizens served by this station. Why? Because this is not property tax money that did this. As Van said, this is that 1% local option sales tax that has built this facility and done many, many other projects in this community. Savannah City Manager and Stephanie Cutter congratulated all city departments and the contractors that made the new fire station a reality. She says it's reflective of the mayor and alderman's commitment to public safety and it utilizes community space to nurture relationships between citizens and public safety personnel. Savannah Fire Chief Charles Middleton says it allows the department to provide services that enhance the quality of life in this community. This is your house that we are allowed to occupy to serve you. That's probably the easiest way that I could describe it. Each time that we come into a new facility like this, what it represents to us is uh, an opportunity, a, a higher calling, if you will, to make sure that the services we provide match your expectations. And this is a symbol, this brand new shining facility is, a, is, is really, uh, it represents the quality of service, the sterling type service that we, we look to provide. This new station replaces old station five on West Henry Street, which is now home to the department's special operations division, which encompasses hazmat, technical rescue, water rescue, Georgia search and rescue task force five operations and industrial firefighting. In addition to the Thomas Square Fire Station, the city has broken ground on a new station in the Bradley Point neighborhood off Highway 17 South, and construction is already underway. We'll have more as work progresses. Coming up on City Span, shopping carts on the loose, and later, Olympic Games, playground style. Woody Allen once said that 80% of success in life is just showing up. It's a simple and yet essential rule of thumb that the city of Savannah is trying to drive home with area youth through its new pre-apprentice program. 34 youth between the ages of 14 and 16 became the first to complete the program this August. Newly minted graduates of Savannah's youth pre-apprentice program. The city's unique approach to addressing the challenges facing many area youth today. It's designed to give kids the basic tools and critical life skills to help them on the road to adulthood. In addressing the 34 graduates at the Civic Center ceremony August 1st, program founder and city manager Stephanie Cutter said the goal was to teach youth that practical life skills were key to realizing their dreams. And I believe that all young people should have dreams. Today, what I see is a reflection of just how great each and every one of these students are. It is reflection of, of a staff that was willing to come together and work hard and, and dedicate themselves throughout the summer to provide this opportunity for students to show them what it meant to earn a paycheck, to teach them what it meant to save a dollar, to teach them the importance of education, to teach them that they can dream. And the seven-week program was hands-on, doing things like painting houses around the city and working on basics, learning the importance of showing up for work, taking their job seriously, and learning how to work with others. They also learned how to budget their money, how to manage a bank account, and to pay their debts. And they brushed up on reading, writing, and math skills as well. 
These are hardworking young people. Our young men here who are, who are behind us, they work by themselves. They are very self-sufficient. Um, they, they, they choose not to have a cute crew chief. They choose to be their own leaders, and we love that because, as you can see, how well they work together. This gives them a sense of autonomy. They can also they can see their work in action. This also gives them a sense of pride because they all they they are actually working with their hands, and they go just ride around Savannah and show their friends I paint that painted that house. Myra Preston, a Tatumville resident, was deeply moved when the pre-apprentice crew showed up to repaint her house. She wanted to give something in return. So she pulled out her grill and started a barbecue. I worked all my life. I work at the prison. I know how it is. When you a, a child raise children too, you got to give them a chance and teach them how to work. You understand? It's overwhelming. It made me want to cry. Good afternoon. Marquise Lee of Johnson High School said he had taken away some valuable lessons from his seven weeks. It was, it was a nice program, it gave us a better understanding of life and how to be more responsible and independent. The program is expected to continue with a new class next year. City staff will use information gathered from this first year pilot program and examine the success of the participants to determine the program's future. Since 2004, the Savannah Youth Council has been held up as a national model for providing young people with leadership opportunities and a chance to learn about government and engage citizenship. Okay, I, and state your name, do hereby affirm that I desire to be a member of the City of Savannah Youth Council. On August 6, 44 students from Channel County became official members of the Savannah Youth Council Class of 2014, with Mayor Edna Jackson administering the oath of service as proud family members looked on. Composed of a diverse group of 8th grade students, the Savannah Youth Council is a result of the mayor and the alderman's vision to provide a support system that will encourage young people to expand, develop, and grow toward a successful and productive future. As you move forth, in life, when you become the college student, when you become the career person, that it started here and this is the bridge that helped you to get to wherever you want to be. Our position is, is that we have to do everything we can, as much as we can, in any way we can, to ensure that every young person in this community has the opportunity to grow up successful, and has the opportunity to be everything that they want to be so that they can come back and help our city to continue to grow. That is our position. The Youth Council provides our local eighth graders with leadership opportunities and knowledge of local government. Members will work closely with the Savannah City Council and will have the opportunity to take educational field trips to meet legislators at the state capitol in Atlanta, participate in the National League of Cities annual conference and visit with officials on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. After receiving numerous complaints from residents tired of seeing shopping carts abandoned along streets, canals, bus stops, and in yards, the City of Savannah is working with businesses to ensure that abandoned shopping carts are not contributing to the neighborhood blight. You know, based on very preliminary observations, what we're finding is that um, residents are using carts um, and they're using them to transport goods or groceries or other items um, to and from their residences and also um, to and from um, various bus stops. Um, the carts are not being returned um, and instead they're often being abandoned and left in various locations um, including you know, our streets, um, parks, canals. Um, and so we're basically trying to um, conduct cart scans throughout the entire city um, in order to try to assess the situation um, and evaluate the severity of the problem um, and also to um, identify areas of major concern. And while the perception in the community, especially among businesses, is that the city is about to start levying fines for stray carts, city officials say that is not the case. We're not at a point to where we're actually going out and finding establishments. So at this point, we really want to um, encourage our local merchants 
um, to designate appropriate staff in order to go out and conduct frequent cart scans in the um, areas surrounding their store premises um, so that the carts can be retrieved in a timely manner. Working together with the city and the Victorian Neighborhood Association, the downtown Kroger has developed somewhat of a pilot program that's showing signs of success. They have designated staff in order to go out and collect um, abandoned carts in their areas and since we've been working with them we have noted um, a significant reduction in the um, number of abandoned shopping carts found in that area. And while ownership of the carts may place the burden of recovery on the merchants who often have little control of the carts being removed from their property, the city is also asking residents to help. We also want to um, you know, ask our residents to please return the carts to um, the locations where they belong. Um, these carts can be very expensive. They can range anywhere between $100 to $300, which can definitely be um, a significant cost to um, merchants. And often what happens is the merchants end up passing along this cost to customers you know, um, in the form of higher retail prices for their items. City staff will continue to assess the problem and search for solutions and will come back to City Council with recommendations on how to address the issue. There is much of a part of Savannah's charm and ambiance as the live oaks and the city squares, but recent issues, especially where cleanup is concerned, required the city to take further action. The five Savannah Horse Carriage Companies employ a total of 22 carriages in the city's downtown streets. After the city deemed cleanup measures on the part of the carriage companies inadequate, it sent letters to the carriage companies in July. The letters reminded the carriage companies of their responsibility to keep the historic district odor free and aesthetically pleasing under city ordinances. We had to, you know, caution the carriage companies and alert them and notify them that there had to be some changes made, otherwise we would have to take some, you know, some measures to ensure that they were complying. Under city ordinance, carriage drivers are required to chemically neutralize urine spills, to mark them with flags, and to notify cleanup crews by phone or text. Carriages are fitted with manure catchers and drivers are expected to ensure that no manure is being spilled along streets. Carriage drivers who fail to comply could have their tour guide permits suspended. As part of its Thrive initiative, the city continues to institute programs to help make Savannah a greener place by helping to reduce the city's carbon footprint and promoting an eco-friendly and sustainable community. City of Savannah Sustainability Coordinator Garrison Marr has more on how possible energy savings may be as simple as a visit to your local library branch. It's August in Georgia, and that means that two things are likely. Afternoon thunderstorms and a little bit higher than normal energy bills. But while we can't do anything about the weather, we can do our own part to bring those energy bills down. But don't take my word for it. We're going to use this power meter to get the projected energy costs straight from the outlets. Right behind HVAC and water heating, one of the largest energy costs is the total of everything plugged into your home's outlets, sometimes called the plug load. And while some items like refrigerators or washer and dryers are a fixed part of that plug load, many other things are not. We've all heard somebody say to us, turn off the lights when we're leaving a room, but what does that really add up to? What we have set up here is a power meter reading the amount of energy consumed by this lamp which has an incandescent light bulb in it. The result is that $4.50 a month is the projected cost of running this lamp for all 30 days. Now we ran the same experiment with the CFL light bulb and that ran to $1.04 over the course of the same time period. Another classic plug load example is leaving the TV on. Here, a TV, a DVD player, and an antenna were left on. The damage? More than $5 a month. The best option is to turn the appliances off and turn a surge protector off so that when the devices are off, they're not drawing any phantom power. Trust me, there's a lot of great science and savings experiments that you can run in your own house and you're closer to a power meter than you might think. Power meters are available for checkout at local branches of the Live Oak Library System. You can check one out and do experiments on your own plug load. That's one great way to save energy and one more way to think green, Savannah. Still ahead on City Spain, two-wheel transportation, options to share.
Georgians are people on the move with a wide range of choices on how they get from where they are to where they're going and all points in between. Just remember, you're sharing your view with others. Be visible, be predictable, and be alert. No matter how you travel, follow traffic laws. Let's get there together, Georgia. A message from the Governor's Office of Highway Safety and Georgia Bikes. Hey, Mom. Welcome back to City Span. I'm Margaret Williams. From the Savannah Bells Ferry to the Dot Downtown Shuttle to environmentally friendly hybrid buses, Chatham Area Transit, or CAT, is an important piece of Savannah's transportation plan, providing a variety of options for residents and tourists. CAT's Patricia Hawkins has more. Hi, I'm Patricia Hawkins with your monthly CAT update. Chatham Area Transit is truly always on the move. As the completion of the new Joe Murray Rivers Intermodal Transit Center draws near, plans are being made for the opening ceremony and the dedication. So look for that sometime in October. Construction continues at the 900 East Gwinnett Street location, CATS Operations Center. Staff has already occupied the second floor office spaces, and demolition continues on the first floor and is closed to the public. But remember, you can still purchase your bus tickets and paratransit tickets in the old courthouse located at 124 Bull Street downtown. In other cat news, Chatham Area Transit is introducing a bike sharing program to the Savannah area. It will be a pilot program with an eight bike station located at the new transit center at 610 West Oglethorpe Avenue. Well, we're very excited that CAT has taken this first step and we're hopeful that it'll grow into a robust system with a, a good network of bike share. We're confident it's going to be a great thing for the city of Savannah and for visitors if we have this robust system. Even if you never use it, it's going to benefit you because it's going to reduce traffic congestion, lessen demand for parking. So we hope to see it grow into a system that allows visitors and residents alike to, to have another way to get where they need to go. A bicycle vendor still needs to be selected and we're hoping to have this process completed soon. Plans are to have the bike share program ready to go by this fall. We'll keep you updated right here on the CAT Update. Until next time, I'm Patricia Hawkins, and as always, thank you for catching a cat. Each month on CitySpan, we team up with the folks at Bank on Savannah, an initiative of Step Up Savannah, to provide easy tips to help you make the most of your money. With more, here's Richard Reed from Consumer Credit Counseling. In order to have an effective household spending plan, you have to stay organized. Today, we'll share some organization tips to keep your money management stress-free. One of the first steps to getting organized is to hold a household meeting. Get the kids involved by discussing needs versus wants with them and share financial goals with each other such as attending college, buying a home, or purchasing a car. Involving the entire household will help prioritize your spending. If your household is just you, it's still important to take the time to sit down and look at your income and expenses as well as your needs and wants. Another way to get organized is to designate a place in your home to keep all your financial information. Get a file cabinet to store important documents, bills, and receipts. Many people like to pay their bills online, so create a space next to your computer that is your financial information center. Stock this area with things you'll need like a checkbook, calculator, calendar, and mailing supplies. Decide on a place that makes sense for you and your family and develop a system that will work for everyone. Your household spending plan should become part of your routine. Some people find it useful and helpful to keep up to date with their expenses by retaining all their receipts. This helps you calculate how and where your money is being spent. Some folks create an inbox to place receipts and paid bills. Others prefer to do this online or with their phone. Instead of wondering where your money went each month, getting organized can help you tell your money where it will go. Next time, we'll discuss how to plan and achieve your financial goals. Until then, I'm Richard Reeve, and you can bank on this. And finally, it's been a long, hot summer in Savannah. Luckily, the city's summer recreation program has been in full swing, offering local youth plenty of chances to have fun and cool down. An estimated 500 kids participated in this year's supervised playground program, culminating in the annual Playground Olympics held at Daffin Park. 
It's a morning full of fun and games, with everything from tug of war to sack races to volleyball to jump rope. But the point is serious. As a place city USA, Savannah has been recognized for its commitment to making sure that youth of all ages have access to leisure facilities and activities. It's all part of an effort to get our kids moving and having fun doing it, while helping to fight obesity and other youth health problems related to inactivity. We, we promote fitness and children being active uh, in efforts to help reduce the obesity that we know that is found in children today. The Playground Olympics was followed by a competitive swim meet at the Daffin Park Swimming Pool. Kids from the city's nine public pools battled it out in everything from the 100 meter freestyle to the backstroke. The competition was interrupted by bad weather, but organizers managed to make it through all the scheduled events. Meanwhile, Savannah's Department of Cultural Affairs closed out its annual summer arts camp with a theater show at the city's Space Gallery on Henry Street. Kids aged 6 to 12 showcased their talents to admiring parents and family who packed the house for the end of summer event. The city provides seven weeks of camps each summer. Students participate in visual and performing arts classes and design the sets, props, and costumes for the end of week performances. For more information about any of the city's cultural and recreational programs, including upcoming fall programs, visit the city's website, savannahga.gov. That's going to do it for this edition of City Span. Don't forget, for the latest news and information about the city of Savannah, keep it tuned to SGTV. Visit our website, savannahga.gov, or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, I'm Margaret Williams. Thanks for watching, and thanks for making Savannah your home. <music>